Great. Um, so uh, today we have Heather Hulsh from McAndrews Milnick. Uh, it's a long name, McAndrews Law, we're going to go with today. Um, sure, no problem. <laughs> um, but uh, Heather is going to be speaking with us um, regarding uh, the COVID-19 pandemic and special education uh, in, in, in this time. Um, so Heather's an attorney. She knows what she's talking about. She can answer questions regarding um, IEPs uh, and any other questions you have regarding, um, you know, your, your child or your, um, you, you know, dependents educational needs during this time. And we're absolutely going to share all this information, um, you know, afterwards on our website. Heather's uh, contact information will also be available to everyone. So I, um, Heather's been having some issues with her uh, video via Zoom. So it's just going to be, um, uh, you know, her speaking, which is the most important part of, uh, you know, this whole process anyway. And you guys have uh, your... PowerPoints uh, that were sent to you with your invitation. So you have that as some guidance. And um, if you need anything additional, the Q&A is open. So feel free to ask questions. Um, and I think Heather decided she was gonna do her presentation first and then answer questions. And if anybody needs any follow-up or you know has uh, questions that need to be answered uh, privately, that's also gonna absolutely be an option. Um, so I'm going to turn it over to Heather, and I am going to get rid of myself so you don't have to look at me. So, uh, Heather, thank you. Look forward thank to Thank you, Megan. Thanks. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. um, and if anyone has to leave early for any reason and has questions, um, you know, don't hesitate to jump in and, and ask those questions. I'm, um, I'm happy to, to answer those. I understand some, you know, some of you might have time constraints. Um, I, so we're going to try to cover a lot of ground um, in, a, in a relatively short amount of time. So I, I do want to put out there that I am available. You please feel free. We'll, you know, we'll have information with my contact information, telephone, email, um, and you can please feel free to contact me with any questions or concerns or any issues that you're having. Um, so first, I want to also point out that just generally speaking, School districts, charter schools are obligated to provide a free appropriate public education to students that have special education needs. And if we, um, you know, we're not going to really go into what exactly that means. Um, that in and of itself is a whole, you know, another presentation that um, would take take a lot of time. So if you have specific um, questions about that, I'm, again, I'm happy to address that at some point. We can talk about that, you know, at any point after the, the presentation. But, you know, in a nutshell, school districts are um, obligated to evaluate, seek out, evaluate, and identify students with special education needs. Um, those needs are, uh, could be academic, social, emotional, developmental, physical, behavioral, um, communication have to do with speech and language, occupational therapy needs. So they are, um, they're obligated to evaluate and identify those needs and then develop a program, an educational program that's based on those needs. And that would be your individualized education program or IEP. So during COVID, um, you know, during the COVID-19 and this pandemic closure, We've all been experiencing, I think, a whole lot of things that we've never experienced before and trying to figure out um, how to navigate through the system and how to make sure your children have, um, are receiving, are going to receive an appropriate educational program, I'm sure is um, on a lot of our minds, so on, on a daily basis. So that's what we're here to talk about. And um, we, while we don't have a ton of guidance, um, you know, certainly from the state, from the federal government in terms of what we need to be doing with this pandemic. Um, we do know that um, we could potentially be in another issue where we're dealing with school closures at some point, um, where we are, um, where we're dealing with um, virtual instruction 
So I think that's something we need to keep in mind and, and keep in mind that this may be something that we may have to deal with, um, whether it's this fall, whether it's down the line sometime, nobody really knows. I, I, I don't um, pretend to know anything about infectious diseases and I leave it up to the experts, but I, I, um, I do know that in terms of students with special education needs, we have received some guidance that um, has solidified that school districts do still need to be providing a free appropriate public education to special education students. So we're gonna talk a little bit more specifically about those areas and what they need to be doing and not be doing and sort of where it makes sense to push, where it makes sense to be flexible. Um, because again, we are dealing with, I think, something that none of us, even school districts and charter schools, um, they've never dealt with this either. So I think we all need to be trying to work together. But again, your children are still entitled to that free appropriate public education during this time. So um, in terms of whether school districts, charter schools need to be having IEP meetings, need to be um, continuing that process and making sure that your children have an IEP in place. Yes, there is the, the there is no waiver in terms of, you know, the COVID-19 did not stop that obligation of school districts and charter schools to continue to have those IEP meetings, continue to complete evaluation, and we'll talk a little bit more in detail about that. Um, so when, when the school closures initially happened on March 12th of this year, um, and again, nobody knew it was coming and we all were sort of, what do we do at this point? Um, the guidance that came out from the United States Department of Education was that if a school district was going to provide any type of instruction to its students, so to its regular education students, then it would still need to provide education to special education students. Um, so if a school district or charter school did decide we're not going to provide any education to any of our students, which at this point, um, I do not believe that any districts in Pennsylvania ha did make that decision to do that. And I think it was because on March 22nd, the United States Department of Education provided some further guidance and um, put out a warning to school districts and charter schools and indicated that, look, don't, you know, deciding not to provide students uh, services to all students because they were worried about their obligation to provide a free appropriate public education to special education students or they were worried about some potential liability, that that would um, that would not bode well for them. So I think that they, you know, they were certainly advised by their attorneys, you know, probably to let's go ahead and provide instruction. Let's, you know, do what we can. So when that happened, I think school districts and charter schools across the state um, had very little guidance about what that's going to look like and what that's going to include. So you ended up with, um, you know, and I've, I've dealt with, been dealing with over these months, um, school districts and charter schools all across the state, and they're, it's very inconsistent. They're all doing it um, a little bit differently. Um, you know, some are, follow, you know, doing um, direct instruction, um, online direct instruction, and this is during, you know, I know the school year has ended, but this is, um, during the school year. They were providing direct instruction in um, academic areas, in social skills, um, counseling services were still being provided online. So that was one end of the spectrum. Then the other end of the spectrum was, you know, schools were providing handouts and homework to students. And there really wasn't a whole lot of direct instruction being provided. And then you had everything in between. So you might have some school districts that were um, 
you know, doing some direct instruction and maybe other teachers. And again, that, that, you know, I think there was some inconsistency with that in terms of, you know, you might have some teachers that were willing to do the direct instruction. Then you had other teachers that were providing handouts. You might have some teachers that had taped their instructions. So there was really um, a full gamut of what was happening in terms of um, how students were receiving their education. The problem with that is, is, not everyone was certainly receiving an appropriate education. So again, because school districts were providing education to all students in some fashion, your, uh, our special education students should be provided with a free appropriate public education as well. And that means that they should be provided with the same thing that they were being provided with in the building. Um, so if they were getting, you know, two times a week of 30 minutes uh, sessions of speech and language services, then that should still have continued. Um, you know, those services can happen in a remote fashion, just as I'm sure all of us have really come to learn and, and see how much can happen, um, you know, virtually. And so those services can still be provided um, in a, you know, in a virtual format. So, so that's um, the, you know, those are things that should have been continued and will need to, con you know, continue. In terms of um, timelines for um, completion of evaluations, reevaluations, IEPs, none of those timelines have been waived. So the United States Department of Education, no one has come out and said, we are going to uh, let school districts have more time to complete evaluations because of this pandemic. So they are, um, they are relying on school districts to figure out um, and maybe you know, be, be more creative than they've had to be in terms of making sure that evaluations are completed, re-evaluations are completed, and IEP meetings are developed. Um, I will say this, the, so IEP meetings, is that's almost an easier one. Um, I think school districts, for the most part, have stepped up to the plate, have figured out that we can still have IEP meetings, we can have them just as we are having this meeting, um, you know, via Zoom, uh, participants can share documents, um, you know, the, the same kinds of things that can happen around a table can happen you know, in a, in a Zoom fashion, in a, in a virtual meeting. So that's, that seems to have, they really have, I think, for the most part, been continuing that process. Where I've seen the struggle um, is with the evaluations and reevaluations. Um, and so s s school districts, again, have the, the timelines are not waived. So they have 60 days to complete an evaluation or reevaluation from the time a parent signs that permission to evaluate or prior written notice for completion of an evaluation. Now, summers don't count. So if there was some um, permission to evaluate or consent form that was signed, you know, right at the end of the school year, the summer months would not count. And then the, the 60 days would continue to um, you know, once the school year started, you would start counting the days, and it is calendar days, except the summers are excluded. So I had, um, I had quite a few cases where we had evaluations that were in the process of being completed, um, and the 60 days were, were um, ran out during the COVID, um, you know, during this closure, during the school closure, and many school districts have taken the position that, well, we, you know, they've sent out either a, a, a draft of an evaluation report or a reevaluation report, you know, with no data or information, just simply saying, um, you know, we weren't able to complete this evaluation. Um, we will issue a new permission to evaluate um, when schools reopen, yada, yada, due to COVID-19. Um, or sometimes they're just sending letters saying that. So, and I have to tell you that um, I, um, I think I've been successful at being able to 
convince uh, at least some of their counsel that that's not going to that's not going to work out well for them. I think if think if we ended up in a hearing, um, and there's are a couple cases they're potentially going to hearing, but I think they'll probably resolve because the districts realize that if you don't do anything, so which which is what they've done. You know, they just issued a, 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 a reevaluation report or reevaluation report or sent a letter with no information, no data. If you don't do anything, I don't think you're going to get away with that. I don't think you're going to be able to say, okay, well, we, you know, oh, pandemic, shut down, we don't do anything. As we all have been realizing, life needs to go on and we need to maybe figure out a different way of doing things. And moreover, there are certain uh, assessments that are part of, um, typically part of evaluations and reevaluations that easily could be, ha could be completed. And so maybe there's something that they say, okay, we can't do this piece of it. So, you know, we're going to put that on hold, but the, to say we, you know, we can't do anything I think is, is going to be a problem for them. And I'm going to get a little bit in more detail about that, um, about those specific areas of assessment in just a little bit. Um, so, uh, let's see here. Um, we talked about that. Um, in terms of 504 services, I think we are dealing with the same thing. We, it, you know, a student is still eligible to receive Section 504 plans. So if they're if they have in their 504 plan accommodations or supports, those still need to be implemented. So, it, you know, if your child when school shut down had a 504 plan and they're in their 504 plan there was an accommodation for study guides to be provided um, a week before uh, tests that still needed to happen so whatever accommodations were in that 504 plan still need to continue um, again any related services speech and language occupational therapy physical therapy they there may be you know ways that they need to be more creative in terms of providing those services, um, but it, it still needs to happen. And, you know, if that needs to, so let's say it's a physical therapy service, for example, which would require um, some hands-on um, service from the physical therapist, under the IDA, there is a service, a related service called parental training. And um, it's, it's very underutilized. A lot of people don't even know about it. But I think it's, it becomes really important in, in a time like this, where we, you know, when you're dealing with a service where you need a more hands-on approach, why can't we have the physical therapist offering that service as a related service, the parent training, and train them how to help um, their child with their physical therapy goals, for example. So, um, and it doesn't, it's not just uh, limited to physical therapy. The training could also be related to instruction so that, you know, if a teacher needs to help um, teach a parent, uh, you know, ways to instruct their children because they're home or behavioral techniques that might be beneficial to your child because they're now, you know, they're receiving that instruction home. That is something that um, it is, again, it's in the IDA. I think it becomes even more of a necessity during um, a time like this. And certainly that's something that, you know, you as a parent can request. Say, well, you know, I'd like some parent training in this specific area and here's why. Um, and again, as long as it's because you need to help your child be successful with their IEP, then that's something that they, you know, that they should certainly be considering if not providing. Um, in terms of 
vocational training, uh, programming. I want to touch a little bit a bit about that because this may be a little bit more challenging. Um, so vocational training typically begins um, transitional services in a student's IEP begin at 14. You tend to see more of those vocational services um, when they get into high school. So I don't know if anyone has children that are in a vocational program or work-based program and because of um, the the pandemic, things have been shut down. So one thing to, to think about is there may be some ways that students can still receive vocational programming. It might not be where they're getting that work-based programming. So it might happen in a more um, instructional classroom simulated. Um, and you know, if that happens, it has to happen virtually. But that, you know, again, getting them to think outside the box that you know if your child still needs this piece this vocational instruction they have vocational goals in their iep well you know the the work program has closed there's no way for the the student to go to the program and receive that vocational programming there may be ways to get that vocational programming in a simulated classroom instruction so just you know again be pushing them to think about you know, and, and provide that service that, that your child needs. Um, homeschooling is, um, so homeschooling is not the school district providing or the charter school providing the instruction. Homeschooling would be, is if you as a parent said, I'm going to provide the instruction to my child, I'm going to, um, you have to use the Pennsylvania curriculum. There's things, guidelines you have to follow, but I'm going to be the one providing that instruction to my child and teaching them and developing their school day. Um, in terms of how COVID-19 has impacted um, homeschooling, there really has not been guidance on that. Um, the assumption is that they would still be providing that home instruction. You know, I would st still go ahead and submit whatever portfolios are uh, required um, as part of that uh, as part of that program um, in terms of counseling services because this is another big service that you know school districts may say or charter schools well because of covid we can't provide um, counseling services and that's something that's in your child's iep if they have you know weekly or daily counseling services Again, that is something that can happen virtually. Um, there are psychologists, counselors, therapists all across the state that are considered essential. Even when we were shut down and everything was in red, they were essential employees. And rightfully so. I mean, they're, they're, they're providing services that are necessary to people with needs. So there they did that remotely. Now, I think they had the option, a lot of um, facilities that I'm familiar with had the option of, you know, people wanted to come in, but many people chose not to, and they had those services virtually, um, either, um, you know, through a Zoom meeting like this, or through um, even just somebody, you know, having the FaceTime on their phone, um, you know, being able to have teletherapy or video conferencing. So there is absolutely no reason why that could not continue and should not be continuing. Um, your children should be receiving those counseling services that are in their IEPs. Um, and another piece to add to that, it may be that they need the, the level of service, you, you know, the school district maybe should look at that to see do we need to be increasing that service, for example? You know, it, I think it, um, all of us are dealing with, again, something we've never dealt with and maybe feeling some anxiety because of that. So students that already have anxiety and deal with that on a regular basis, because of the pandemic, their anxiety may have increased. So we, we may need to think about increasing services as a result of that. Um, on the other end of the spectrum, maybe students that have, you know, a lot of school-based anxiety and anxiety being in school, um, you know, maybe now that they're home, um, that anxiety has decreased and maybe it makes sense to, to you know, decreasing those services, um, at, you know, at this time. So again, just, just food for thought there. Um, 
I'm going to skip the part on incarcerated youth unless somebody shouts out that that's something that we need to talk about. Um, and then, let's see here. Um, so let's talk about the evaluations um, because I think this is the more challenging piece right now. Again, the, the you know, the development and implementation of IEPs should be, should be relatively easy for them. The, they're putting up, seems to be more of an issue with conducting evaluations. And, you know, some of the arguments I've heard is, well, we need to conduct these um, evaluations face-to-face. -face, um, and we, you know, we're, we're um, impacting the validity of the assessment because it can't be conducted in a fashion that, you know, where we're having an examiner and examinee sitting at the table together um, face to face. So th there's really, there, that may be an issue, but let's talk about the specific areas of assessments and whether or not that's an issue and where you can sort of push with your district and say, mm, I think you can be doing this. So first we talk about data review, okay? Um, getting information from the students' records. Um, report, looking at report cards, looking at progress reports, looking at any evaluations that have been completed in school, any outside evaluations that have been completed. Um, parent input, getting information from the parent. Um, usually there's forms that parents complete that have questions, you know, about developmental history, how the child's doing academically, socially, emotionally, you know, areas of concern, that kind of thing. Teacher input, getting input from teachers, how the student does in their classroom, you know, what specific um, accommodations they're providing, if any. So those are all things that absolutely can be provided without any face-to-face -face contact. So if a school district is telling you they cannot do that, I think that they are not, not giving themselves enough credit because there's absolutely no reason why they can't be doing that. Um, so let's see here. Rating scales. So this is when we're asking um, parents to complete rating scales. Um, sure, a lot of you are familiar with these. They're um, standardized forms. Um, they, there'll be questions or statements, and then there'll be typically a Likert scale where it'd have one to five, you know, or something like um, never, seldom, you know, sometimes, almost always, always. So, there, you know, you're, you're completing a rating scale. Uh, Parents complete those, teachers complete those, service by providers, and sometimes the students do a self-report. All of those things can happen without any contact, face-to-face -face contact between an evaluator and, and the student. All of those things can happen remotely. So again, if we're trying to get information about a student that has executive functioning needs, so that would be a student that has um, ADHD or sometimes at mood disorders or autism, you can have executive functioning needs. That's your ability to plan and organize. There are rating scales for executive functioning. We don't, we, we don't need a face-to-face -face assessment to get that information. Uh, social, emotional, behavioral needs. Um, that is how we get information, um, you know, from parents and teachers and service providers about how the students functioning social emotional behavior that's one way we can do it so certainly that is something that if we need that information as part of an evaluation we should be getting that um, assessments that the the so then we talk about assessments that could be completed over video conferencing. So maybe we can't, you know, when we're talking about input and rating skills, there's no contact. It's just somebody completing this, a form and submitting it or providing information and, uh, um, and submitting that. What, if we need assessments, um, actual assessments, but that we could conduct those assessments just as we do over Zoom. So um, it may be something that the student has been provided um, something ahead of time, 
it may be something that we need the student and the evaluator to develop rapport ahead of time. So maybe, you know, we don't just have the evaluator and the student get on a Zoom meeting and let's start the assessment right away. Um, you know, th these things may take more time. It may be that you have to have the evaluator and the student have a couple Zoom meetings ahead of time to get to know each other, develop rapport, so then we can start assessing, um, you know, again, the assessments that uh, w would, would still be considered valid um, you know, when they're not con conducted face-to-face. -face. Um, and there has been some guidance from the um, Pennsylvania and National Psychological Association about how um, assessments can be conducted virtually and, you know, what we can do to help um, ensure that test validity is still maintained. So then the um, last sort of piece that we need to talk about is what if we really can't do an assessment um, in a way that is virtual? So I'm gonna give you an example or a couple examples. So if you have a student that is, has significant behavioral needs um, and you know, when, when they were in the school setting, they were having, you know, there might be um, behavior incidences happening, you know, five to 10 times a day. I'm just throwing out an example. But let's say you have a student like that where we really need to get a handle on what is the function of those behaviors. What's causing those behaviors or what's, what's causing the student to respond in that way. So um, what we really need to do is called a functional behavior assessment. So we, that, that involves a series of observations of the student in a variety of settings. So we might want to observe them um, in a more structured educational setting versus a less structured educational setting. So in a classroom like math or English language arts, maybe want to then observe them in um, lunch, recess, or a special, you know, something less structured. Um, get several observations is even better in those settings. It, you know, we might want to observe them uh, in different points of the day to see how they do in the morning versus afternoon because some kids it may be that you know the afternoon is a struggle for them and it may be there's a variety of reasons again it, without a functional behavior assessment you aren't able to really understand what's driving those behaviors and so it may be that we need to say okay we're not going to be able to complete this part of the assessment and I'll talk about some options and what we can do Another example is if you're dealing with a student that is significantly intellectually disabled, for example, and a virtual assessment of them just cannot be completed because they are not able, they don't have the capacity to pay attention, to focus, to comprehend that piece of it that is something that may need to happen in a face-to-face -face setting. So again, and what the National and um, Pennsylvania Psychological Associations have said is that, you know, school psychologists need to uh, assess on a case-by-case -case basis when it is appropriate, when it, you know, when they can complete an assessment validly um, in a virtual format and when they can't. And again, I've just given you examples of where I can certainly see where it doesn't make sense, um, where we're not gonna be able to complete a valid assessment. So what do we do in those situations? Um, there's a couple things. One would be that the school district could go ahead and issue a partial report and then follow up with an addendum. So they, if they, you know, let's say they've, they've been able to complete the record review, the rating scales, the, you know, getting input from the parents and the teachers, maybe they've even been able to do some uh, virtual assessments of the student, but they're not able to get this functional behavior assessment piece, for example. They go ahead and they issue the results of everything else, and we'll, you know, there'll be in there a piece that says, we, you know, due to COVID-19, we're not able to complete the functional behavior assessment. As soon as the schools reopen and we're able to complete that, you know, we'll go ahead and do that. Um, so that's one uh, way to go ahead. And this, the other way, I think, would just be postponing a report altogether 
um, you know, which we, which is what we're seeing. I think what I'm seeing in my experience, school districts doing, you know, just saying, okay, well, we're not going to do any testing, um, and we'll go ahead and we're going to wait. Um, so I bet you can guess what I think is the better one. Um, certainly issuing, if we can get as much information as we can, let's do that. And then if there's something that we do need to, to you know, set aside until we can do it in a face-to-face -face or when schools reopen, then we can, okay, we can agree to put that to the side. Um, but that's what I think school districts need to be doing. And I think parents need to understand when they, you know, when they should be pushing and when they need to be a little more flexible. And just, you know, thinking about it again, thinking about your child's needs. And can, is this something that can be assessed um, in a virtual format? Um, so let's see here. So what... What can we do if this, you know, if, if we're looking for programming and the school district saying, no, we can't do that. Um, here's some ideas. Okay. So one, give them ideas, give them, you know, sometimes districts are, you know, we're really just thinking about it. This is the way we're, you know, we're used to doing it and not used to thinking outside the box. So, you know, say, Hey, uh, you know, is there a way we can do this? You know, counseling service. I, you know, my, my son gets counseling services via teletherapy. You know, can't we still continue that? Can we continue, continue that? Um, you know, uh, is there a way we can do speech and language therapy virtually if they're telling you no? You know, I, I, you know, I know that my friend in this district is getting their speech and language services virtually. Is that something we can try? Um, so that's certainly, you know, your first try to get them to do it, try to push them by, um, I always advocate to be respectful and, you know, and I think you, you, you're more inclined to get somebody to agree to something if you're, you know, if you can convince them in a professional way. So, you know, I, that's what I would do first. Um, if they don't, if they still don't agree, um, I think you need to have them note your disagreement because a lot of these meetings are happening virtually so you need to say you know look I'd like you to note my disagreement we'll have to agree to disagree but um, and then if if possible I would follow that up with an email and say I just want it to um, confirm that this is what I've asked for the district has said no you know these are their reasons I don't agree with that and put you know document that um, Another suggestion is to, you know, try working your way up the chain. You know what I mean? If, if somebody's telling you no, and let's say it's the building principal, you know, is there a special ed coordinator? Is there a special ed director? Um, you know, if you have to, is there a superintendent? You know, so um, that might be an avenue. Of course, you, you know, you can always feel free to give, give us a call. And I should mention that we provide services um, uh, very frequently at no cost to families. So um, I don't want people to get hung up on, oh my gosh, it's a lawyer. It's going to, you know, it's going to uh, put us in debt. So we, you know, give us a call. We, we you know, we, we very often provide services at, at no cost to families. Um, if you are in a position where the district is um, refusing services and you feel that your child is eligible, you should also note with them that they're going to need to provide compensatory education services. So, um, and that is something that is, we also have received some guidance from the United States Department of Education, that if, if a school district is not providing, so let's say they're, you know, during the, the school closure, your, your child was not getting um, speech and language services, counseling services, or even the academic instruction they were entitled to, they're owed that. They're owed compensatory education services. And the United States Department of Education has made it clear to them that that is something that they should be offering to families, okay? So let's talk a little bit about that and um, how we would go about making that request and what to do if that's not honored. Um, so 
again, what they're saying is United States Department of Education, when schools reopen, they must make an individualized determination of what and to what extent compensatory education services uh, may be needed um, to make up for any skills that may have been lost. We don't have any more guidance than that, but I think, you know, it's helpful that we at least have some. Um, districts um, will be expected to hold IEP meetings when students return to school. So, you know, once we're changing from a virtual to back in brick and mortar, they should be having IEP meetings for special education students. Let's get a, you know, let's get an, an understanding of where we are now. Um, we might need to do some updated assessments. We might need to do some curriculum-based assessments, some progress monitoring of goals. Um, well, they should be progress monitoring goals anyway, but some updated baselines, for example. Um, and then they should be talking about whether, you know, if these services were not provided and these skills were lost um, or, you know, progress was not made, well, we need to, you know, we need to provide those compensatory services. So, for example, what that would look like is let's say your child was supposed to get 30 minutes, two times a week of speech and language services and they didn't get any. So now when they go back to school, let's assume they go back to school in the fall, instead of getting 30 minutes twice a week, they'll add in another 30 minute session, you know, each week to make up for those until they make up. So that's what those compensatory services um, or what the United States Department of Education um, I think envisions. There is the less likely option of a compensatory education fund. So a school district setting aside a fund that the parent can then access for those services outside of school. Now that on a on a on a regular basis, that is what we do when a student has not been provided with a free appropriate public education. We seek compensatory education service. Oftentimes the districts and the families are able to negotiate a fund that can then be accessed for these kinds of things. So I think that's probably more um, more likely to happen when uh, there's there's attorneys involved. I think if we're having a district that's going to agree, okay, yes, compensatory services should be provided because we didn't provide services during COVID-19 or, you know, the services weren't what they should have been it's going to be offered in a, you know, we'll bump up the services. Um, extended school year. So extended school year um, should, I don't know if anyone's had experience with, because it should be ready to start. And I think it's, you know, are schools doing it virtually? Are they doing it face-to-face? -face? I'm not really sure yet what they're planning because it seems like we're not getting a whole lot of guidance from the state. Um, we did have, you know, that schools were gonna open on July 1st, but now that the numbers are going up, I think it, it seems to be going in a different direction. I do think they're probably, you know, if they are, um, uh, implementing an ESY program in a face-to-face uh, -face that there's going to be social distancing, students are probably going to be required to wear masks, at, at least at this point. So I don't know if anyone's had experience with that, but I think right now that's what we're looking at. Um, okay, one thing I really want to talk about is NORAPs and waivers, FAPE waivers, and how, so you probably have received these already and it's okay if you haven't filled them out or if you've filled them out, it, you know, you can, you can go ahead and note this, you know, if you need to do this. Um, so when schools shut down, um, school, a lot of school districts started sending out um, notices of recommended educational placement or NORAPs. Um, that say, okay, we're, you know, your child is not going to receive, um, you know, their full IEP. We're doing program, um, programming virtually. So in the interim, here's what we're going to be providing. And they'll, you know, give you a breakdown of what your child's receiving during this temporary um, 
you know, program temporary, the, you know, and they'll say that in there that it'll go back to your regular IEP. However, the concern is that if they're reducing those services so much that your child's still not receiving a free appropriate public education, you need to, you need to tell them that. So, you know, what I've been advising parents to do is to agree to approve that NORAP because you do want those services and, you know, something's better than nothing, but you need to write next to that. I, you know, I approve to the extent that this is what's being offered. However, I don't believe that this is a free appropriate public education. Um, or I agree to the implementation of this distance learning plan, but not to its appropriateness. You know, something to that effect where you're letting the district know, go ahead and implement it, <laughs> but I don't think it's, it's everything my child needs. Okay. Um, so let's see here. So in that's I that is in a nutshell the information I have. I'm certainly um, oh, ready open to answer questions that you may have. Um, and again, even if it's general information, um, I'm happy to do that. I do, do you, I do have some questions here, it looks like on, um, on this chat. So and unless anyone objects, I can go ahead and answer. Could you answer that, Heather? I apologize. I had to leave to go to another meeting. So I, I did uh, cover that, that you'd answer that in the chat, but if you could answer now, that would be fantastic. Of course. So the question is, my son's IEP goals all said, he did not meet his goals because of COVID-19 pandemic. My son had several academic goals and a behavioral goal on his IEP. My son did not receive individual academic instruction from his teacher or his learning support teacher. What can I do? Can he be eligible for compensatory services? What Would I be eligible to file for due process? Also, my son is transferring to a new district in August. Does the new district need to follow his current IEP? Okay, so great questions. Um, okay, absolutely, this is an example of where th the school district has not provided a free appropriate public education to this child. If they did not provide academic instruction, they did not provide the behavior support, and then they're indicating he didn't make progress because of COVID-19 pandemic. No, he didn't make progress because you didn't provide the instruction that he needed during the COVID-19 pandemic. So, um, and the, you know, this is, again, this is, I think some districts look, you know, because they didn't know what to do or they weren't thinking real hard, you know, saying just kind of using this as an excuse. Um, and that's not, I don't think that's acceptable. So I think that, you know, the parent can absolutely do something in this situation. Again, this would be a denial of FAPE claim. Um, can he be eligible for compensatory services? Yes, I think he can be eligible for compensatory services because again, they're even admitting he didn't meet his goals and he didn't provide instruction. They didn't provide instruction. Would, uh, would she be eligible to file for due process? Yes. I will say this, um, filing for due process. So due, due process is, if you look at the statistics um, for parents that pursue due process with and without an attorney, the success rate is significantly higher for parents that pursue due process with an attorney. Um, this navigating through due process is not easy at all. Um, I've been doing this many years and due process hearings are the most challenging part of of our of our jobs there's um you know not only do you have to know and understand fully the law you have to know and understand the um the system and um you know how um how to cross-examine a school district witness and what to do when they're not answering your question. And these are just things that, you know, they, they come with experience of, of being an attorney. So I would recommend considering if you're going to file for due process to 
reach out to an attorney and, and talk to them and see if that's something that, um, you know, they can help you with because it is, it is not an easy process to go through. Um, so this child is transferring to a new school district in August. Does the, does the new school district need to follow the student's IEP? So if they're transferring in state, they would need to follow the student's IEP. Um, once they, they have the student in their district, if they want to uh, conduct reevaluations, they can go ahead and issue a permission to evaluate um, and then take a look at the, you know, whether services need to be um, um, increased, decreased, or um, revised in any fashion. Um, if, you're, if you're moving out of state, they have to provide services that are, um, it, they don't have to follow the exact IEP, but they have to follow services that are consistent with that IEP um, until they're able to reevaluate and offer offer an appropriate program in their in their school district in that state. Um, let's see here. It looks like I have another question. How do I file a denial of FAPE claim? Can Can you please call me? Um, yes, absolutely. Um, I, so I, my, I'm going to give you my telephone number, my contact information, and I'm going to ask that you give me a call, um, and I can go ahead and help you with that process. So my phone number is 570-969-1817, 570-969-1817, and my email address is h h. U L S like Sam E at McAndrewsLaw.com. So that's H H U L S E at M C A N D R E W S L A W.com. Okay. Okay. It looks like that's all the questions that are at least um, in the chat. Does anyone have any questions? If anyone has any follow-up questions that you think of after digesting all this information, you're welcome to contact Heather directly or you can also email us at NAMI and we will be happy to pass along uh, all of Heather's content um, and information, contact information. And uh, we will also be posting the webinar on our website and sharing it with uh, McAndrews for their uh, availability to share. So if there's something you missed or you wanna listen to again, we'll be happy to do that. And I apologize for having to uh, disconnect and reconnect on my phone. So um, I apologize. Uh, too many things on the schedule. <laughs> Megan, I can't thank you enough. And thank you to everyone who, who joined us. And, and like Megan said, I'm very happy to um, help answer any questions. Please feel free to reach out to me anytime. And Heather, thank you again. And I did have a, a couple of people email saying they had difficulty uh, signing in. So um, I might have some more uh, contacts uh, reaching out to you. But thank you so much for your time. A lot of great information. And uh, I, I encourage anyone to ask any uh, questions of Heather or follow up with her in order to, to get, um, you know, if you had some personal questions you didn't feel comfortable asking in the chat to reach out to her that way. So don't hesitate to contact either of us and we'll be happy to help you along. Thank you so much. I couldn't agree more. Thanks, Megan. Thank you guys. Have a great night. You too.